a young girl in London, Mary Godwin often whiled away the hours reading beside her mother's grave. Her mother had been a great feminist and writer who urged young people to experience life to the fullest. Mary took this advice to heart, running away with the then unknown romantic poet Percy Bysshe Shelley when she was just 16. Accompanied by Mary's stepsister, they eventually landed at Lake Geneva in Switzerland, where the three met the famous poet Lord Byron. It was there, on a dare, that Mary imagined and wrote her story about a mad scientist who brought a corpse back to life. Catherine Reef brings into crisp focus this passionate woman, brilliant writer, and forgotten feminist. Shelley's life was fascinating both before and after the publication of Frankenstein, a masterpiece that is as relevant and popular today as it was 200 years ago, its monster firmly embedded in our collective consciousness. The story of the monster's creator, Mary Shelley, is a strange, romantic, and tragic one, as deeply compelling as the creature itself. On August 3, 1845, young Emily Dickinson declared all things are ready, and with this resolute statement, her life as a poet began. Despite spending her days almost entirely at home, the occupation listed on her death certificate, Dickinson's interior world was extraordinary. She loved passionately, was hesitant about publication, embraced seclusion, and created 1,789 poems that she tucked into a dresser drawer. In these fevered days, Martha Ackerman unravels the mysteries of Dickinson's life through ten decisive episodes that distill her evolution as a poet. Ackman follows Dickinson through her religious crisis as well as student at Mount Holyoke, which prefigured her lifelong ambivalence toward organized religion and her deep private spirituality. We see the poet through her exhilarating frenzy of composition, through which we come to understand her fiercely self-critical eye and her relationship with her sister-in-law and first reader Susan Dickinson. Contrary to her reputation as a recluse, Dickinson makes a startling decision to ask a famous editor for advice, writes anguished letters to an unidentified master, and keeps up a lifelong friendship with writer Helen Hunt Jackson. At the peak of her literary productivity, she is seized with despair and confronting potential blindness. I've, even as a little girl, Zora Neale Hurston was confident, charismatic, and determined to be extraordinary. As a proud young girl who grew up in an all-black community in Eatonville, Florida, she didn't experience the pres prejudice that many African Americans felt at the time. In fact, she was so self-confident as a child that she thought the moon followed her wherever she went. She arrived in New York at the height of the Harlem Renaissance and quickly gained recognition for her work, making friends such as Langston Hughes and Ellen Locke. Despite her popularity, Zora was almost always poor and had to work as a personal assistant or housekeeper to feed herself. Still, she remained a proud woman who loved her life, her adventures, her friends, and her husbands. Though all her books were out of print by the time of her death in 1960, Zora's works, like the beloved classic Their Eyes Were Watching God, were rediscovered only ten years later and inspired a whole new generation. The acclaimed team of Dennis and Judith Frayden returned with a remarkable biography of the bright and brilliant Zora Neale Hurston, delivered with precision, humor, and candor, just the way Zora herself would have done it. The name Ernest Hemingway conjures up vivid images, grand adventurer, soldier, war correspondent, big game hunter, bullfight aficionado, and writer. Hemingway is considered one of the greatest writers in modern history, and his novels and stories are read, studied, and imitated around the world. His concise prose style earned him both a Pulitzer and a Nobel Prize. But Hemingway also had a temper and a fondness for drinking and carousing that caused his work to suffer. He was a complex man, a hot-headed starter of arguments and a romantic who married four times. He, perhaps more than any other American writer, truly lived what he wrote. All of this makes for a fascinating read. Author Catherine Reef has comp crafted a compelling biography that is not only a highly enjoyable account of an extraordinary life, but an accessible and tempting introduction to the work of one of our most revered and sometimes reviled American icons. For many people, Webster's is synonymous with the word dictionary, and certainly Noah Webster is best remembered for the famous reference book that bears his name. For Webster, though, this enormous accomplishment was a means to an end. His true goal was to streamline the language spoken in our newly formed country so that it could be used as a force to bring people together and be a source of national pride. Many people laughed at his ideas, but Webster never doubted himself. In the end, his so-called foolish notions achieved just what he had hoped. Catherine Reef tracks the inspiring life of this outspoken, opinionated, and socially awkward man, from his boyhood on a Connecticut farm through the fight for American independence, to his days as a writer and activist who greatly influenced our founding fathers and shaped the direction of the young United States. 
Vincent van Gogh, one of the 19th century's most brilliant artists, will forever be remembered as the Dutchman who cut off his ear. But this incident only underscores the passion that consumed him, a passion that when he took up painting at age 27, infused his work. Whether painting a portrait, a landscape, or a still life, van Gogh sought to capture the vibrant spirit of his subject. It didn't matter that others found his work to be unconventional. Van Gogh persevered. And as he moved from the cold climate of Holland to a balmy southern France, he filled his canvases with vivid color and thick, lush brush strokes that pioneered a new technique and style. In a career spanning only a decade, Van Gogh painted great work after great work, but fame eluded him. This lack of recognition increased his self-doubts and bitter disappointments. Today, however, Vincent Van Gogh stands as a giant among artists, one who endured hardship to fulfill his artistic vision and who lived life true to his convictions. In this absorbing biography, Jan Greenberg and Sandra Jordan present an awkward boy who became a tormented man and an artist who painted some of the most recognized and sought-after masterpieces of all time. Dorothea Lange chose to work as a photographer at a time when family was supposed to come first for a woman. Her passion was photographing people. Like many other women, she had a husband and, a, and children to take care of, but no matter how hard she tried, family life was no substitute for the work she loved. During her career, Dorothea Lang captured some of the most desperate and beautiful faces America has seen. She did her most celebrated work in the 1930s and 40s during the Depression years and the Second World War. Restless Spirit, the life and work of Dorothea Lang, includes over 65 of Lang's extraordinary photographs, printed in high-quality dew tones, and chronicles Lang's life from her childhood experiences on the Lower East Side of New York through her early years as a portrait photographer in San Francisco to her famous work for the government photographing starving migrant workers in California. Also included are her heartbreaking photographs of Japanese Americans interned on the West Coast during World War II. Author Elizabeth Partridge has woven Lang's own words into the book, creating not just another biography, but an intimate portrait of the artist who put faces on some of the darkest episodes in America's history. Restless Spirit presents a magnificent showcase of work that will not soon be forgotten. In the 1880s, Suzanne Valadon was considered the Impressionist's most beautiful model, but behind her captivating facade lay a closely guarded secret. Suzanne was born into poverty in rural France before her mother fled the provinces, taking her to Montmartre. There, as a teenager, Suzanne began posing for and having affairs with some of the age's most renowned painters. Then Renoir caught her indulging in a passion she had been trying to conceal. The model her was herself a talented artist. Some found her vibrant still lives and frank portraits as shocking as her bohemian lifestyle. At 18, she gave birth to an illegitimate child, future painted her Maurice Utrio, but her friends Toulouse, Lautrec, and Degas could see her skill. Rebellious and opinionated, she refused to be confined by tradition or gender, and in 1894 her work was accepted to the Salon de la Société Nationale de Beaux Arts, an extraordinary achievement for a working class woman with no formal art training. Renoir's dancer tells the remarkable tale of an ambitious, headstrong woman fighting to find a professional voice in a male-dominated world. Just before Christmas in 1843, a debt-ridden and dispirited Charles Dickens wrote a small book he hoped would keep his creditors at bay. His publisher turned it down, so Dickens used what little money he had to put out a Christmas carol himself. The book immediately caused a sensation, and it breathed new life into a holiday that had fallen into disfavor, undermined by lingering Puritanism and the cold modernity of the Industrial Revolution. It was a harsh and dreary age, in desperate need of spiritual renewal, ready to embrace a book that ended with blessings for one and all. With warmth, wit, and an infusion of Christmas cheer, Les Standiford whisks us back to Victorian England its most beloved storyteller and the birth of the Christmas we know best. Lorraine Hansberry skyrocketed to fame in 1959 when her play A Raisin in the Sun opened on Broadway to rave reviews. That same year she won the New York Drama Critics Circle Award, edging out such well-known names as Tennessee Williams and Eugene O'Neill. She was only 28 years old. But Lorraine Hansberry was not only one of the most successful American playwrights of a generation. She was also a hardworking activist, a brilliant essayist, and a supportive friend to the remarkable people she knew, including writer James Baldwin, educator W.E.B. Du Bois, and the multi-talented Paul Robeson. In this thoroughly researched and moving biography, the team of Patricia C. and Frederick L. McKissick explore what made Lorraine Hansberry in her short 34 years such a gift to her profession, her people, and her times.